Good morning. It's a Friday morning. It's 11 o'clock and markets have got their Friday cheer. There's been a sudden step up in the markets. The Nifty's crossed 24,100. It's a 200-point up move. I am Reema Tendulkar. With me is Sonal Bhutra. Uh, Sonal, mid-caps are trailing today. Yeah. But, you know, for the last few days, they were outperforming. So despite a, just a, you know, 0.1%, 0.2% gain on the mid-cap index, for the week, the mid-cap index is still up to 1.5%, outperforming the frontline indices. And today, the top spot in terms of gainers goes to Pharma. The Nifty Pharma index is higher with names like Sipla, Sun Pharma, leading gains. But even other heavyweights like Reliance Industries, Bharti. Bharti has been a big mover. l &T, these are stocks on the way up. On the way down, not too many, but a Shriram Finance is correcting an SBI Life in the Red for the second day. Oh, yeah. So those are some uh, stocks which are on our radar. And it's the start of a new series, right? December series. So that also means we're towards the end of the calendar year, Rima. The time's flown and how. But yes, if we talk about the new series, it has started with a bank for sure. Midcaps, as you said, are lagging. But we do have a lot of stock-specific action that we are looking at as well. We have a new listing, Enviro Infra. It's been a strong listing and that, in, uh, that stock is up around 53% as we speak. The top gainers today include uh, Nifty Pharma, Nifty energy energy space that continues to do well so we'll watch out for those names and if the it is the one which is lending support as well reliance industries is the other one uh, which has been in focus a lot of uh, brokerage notes which are coming by for this particular name so watch out for that one the stock up around two percent it's a heavy weight uh, so it makes a lot of difference to the moves that we saw see on the index as well but uh, since we are getting stock specific, Credit Access, that is the stock under pressure after Goldman Sachs has downgraded it to a sell from a buy on the stock. Abhishek is here with more details. Uh, well, six months after we highlighted the pain in microfinance sector, uh, this is the first time that we are seeing a brokerage house uh, downgrading the biggest lender in the uh, MFI space, that is Credit Access Grameen. So Goldman Sachs has downgraded the stock to sell from buy that they had earlier. They have cut the target price by 60% to 564 uh, per share from 1,426 per share that they had earlier. They say that earnings visibility is clouded given the fact that asset quality uh, will deteriorate going ahead. So they they believe that there is de-rating structure in nature which is in place for the stock. Uh, they have um, been negatively surprised by the deterioration in asset quality in Q2 FY25 from Credit Access Grameen. So they expect the deterioration in asset quality to continue and also the fact that MFIN regulations have come in wherein you know you uh, you have uh, per lender three uh, per uh, customer three lenders from the earlier four lenders that will also weigh in uh, you know on uh, the performance of MFI players. So they have cut the EPS uh, by 40 to 50 percent over FI25 to FI27 and they expect the credit cost to be at 6.6 percent .6 for FI25 and about 4.5 percent for FI26. The valuations don't adequately reflect the underlying stress that is there in the system of uh, you know microfinance sector. They also have written on financials wherein they say that uh, sizing the microfinance stress uh, they have sizes anywhere between US dollar of uh, 4 billion to to as high as US dollar 18 billion of potential stress pool in the microfinance sector alone. So that is why they have downgraded, uh, you know, uh, 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 credit access Grameen to sell. And they have a buy on AU Small Finance Bank, LT, that is LNT Finance, as well as Indusind Bank. They say that diversified players are better placed than microfinance lenders. Back to you. Thank you very much uh, for that. And talking about Friday cheer, you can see it in Allied Blenders. There's a bullish note coming in from ICICI Securities. Manglam is here to tell us more. Manglam. Well, yesterday it was Tilaknagar Industries. Today it's Allied Blenders. Uh, ICICI Securities has initiated coverage with the buy rating, target at 400 rupees. What they are expecting going forward is a revenue CAGR of 10% over the next three years. But importantly, the net profit grows at around 30%. Why is it that it happens so? One, because uh, they believe that the company will do premiumization well in the Alcobev Industries. The iconic white whiskey uh, that the company is selling will double its volume in FY25 itself. And even in Officer's Choice, which is basically the mass end whiskey, they will see improved state mix and that itself would aid profitability. But over and above everything else, you know, the company is looking at backward integrating their ENA sourcing. And this is something that the management has been talking about here on CNBC TV 18 as well. That would lead to margin expansion of nearly 170 basis points over the next couple of years. Their target for the long term is industry-leading margins, which is close to around mid-teens itself. 
the key risks as it is with all the alcohol stocks, potential ban or regulatory change in key states and in their case in particular failure to scale up in prestige and above segment largely because of positioning of officers choice is that of a mass brand can the company go ahead of that and get uh, reasonable success in the premium brand is something that we'll be looking at for now the stock doing well yes it is three percent higher on that one thank you so much uh, maglam for joining us with all those details with that it's time for a short break now on the other side we'll be joined by the management of gulf oil lubricants to discuss the company's piaggio partnership renewal and a lot more stay tuned Welcome back. You're still tuned into Trading Hour on CNBC TV 18. It's time to talk about the commodity space. Manisha Gupta is joining us now and today we are going to be focusing on crude oil prices. What's happening here, Manisha? Well, if you look at this week, uh, Sonal, we've seen the crude oil prices continue to decline. 3.5% on the downside until this week, uh, up till now is how we are trading. This is quite opposite or contrary to what we saw the crude oil prices in the previous week when we saw 5% of gains come in for that one. A uh, bit of an uptick on your screens for the crude oil prices, and that comes in on the back of uh, Israel and Lebanon accusing each other of ceasefire violations there. It was after many conversations, various debates that we did reach that agreement, but there are uh, violations being accused from both sides and that is where a bit of a premium seems to be coming back. The markets though are looking at weaker demand that we've seen from US and China in much of this year. Now that we have the 10 and 11 months of data in 2024, those numbers are not in the positive as compared to previous year and that would continue to weigh on to the markets. Apart from that, there also is a gasoline stock surge that we've seen in the US markets on a week on week basis. So even as uh, uh, you know, we are approaching holidays here, the number there continues to decline and that's worrying. The next important thing to watch out would be the OPEC and Allies meeting. Well, that was supposed to happen on 1st of December. Now it's postponed to 5th of December because there were some other events as well. So to avoid conflict, there has been a date change there. But even with that, it continues to be a virtual meeting, this one. And the expectation is that at this meeting, this would be a third straight time that OPEC and Allies will just push ahead furthermore the output increases that they were anticipated to do. Uh, OPEC and Allies have said that they will increase 2.2 million barrels sometime in 2025, but their final verdict or statement will now come in on 5th of December. Thank you, uh, Manisha, for spotlighting that. Moving on now to the first corporate in the show. Gulf Oil Lubricants is in focus after the company renewed its partnership with Piaggio Vehicles till 2030 to deliver lubricants to the company's Piaggio's commercial vehicles. This partnership will cover lubricants including advanced BS6 oils and EV fluids. To discuss this, we have with us Ravi Chavla, Managing Director and CEO of the company. Mr. Chavla, thank you very much for joining in. So first, how is this renewed agreement with Piaggio different compared to what you had in the past? So as we were saying, I think EV fluids are added. What else and what would be the incremental revenues? Well, you see, we have been having a relationship with Piaggio for, uh, uh, you know, in the past also. So the renewal is obviously up to 2030. They have a full range of commercial vehicles, as we know. We've also been supplying them EV fluids for their three-wheelers, which are electric three-wheelers. And uh, what we have now is obviously grow with them as they grow in the market in various segments. And uh, it is obviously an area where... Uh, we are going to supply a complete range of lubricants across all the channels. So it is a continued partnership and we're happy to share that we have renewed it up to 2030. As our strategy has been to work with the OEMs, we have over 40 OEMs in automotive, industrial, construction, EV fluids and AdBlue. So this is part of the strategy and I think uh, this renewal, of course, Piaggio being one of our top five customers. So the incremental will be the growth that uh, Piaggio gets and of course how we can penetrate the market. So in line with our 2 to 3x market growth rate, I think this is another... Uh, you know, I would say uh, area where we can continue doing that. So, Mr. Chavla, how, how much of your revenues right now is coming in from Piaggio and would that continue to be the number as well going forward? Now that you're saying Piaggio is growing, the market is growing, what kind of incremental revenues would you see on the existing number? So, you see, Piaggio has been a partner with us for the last five, six years and this is a renewal. So, as they grow, uh, we grow with them. So, OEMs for us, 
obviously we have certain oems where we have a relationship across their channels some we have in various like the franchisee workshop or aftermarket so oems do make up uh, you know more than 20% of our business in fact some segments higher so i think this is part of that and as uh, we see the vehicle penetration go up and of course the ev vehicles go up for piaggio we will continue to grow so usually our target has been 2 to 3x the industry growth similarly in this area if industry of commercial vehicle oils is growing and overall growth is 3 to 4% we expect to grow two times that at least mm. is piaggio one of your top 10 clients uh, how much did it contribute in terms of revenues what was it growing at just want to understand the significance and just to understand so it's just purely an extension it's the same things that you were supplying to them it just now extended for an additional 5 years till 2030 You see, with the OEMs, uh, it is a long-term relationship because we do a lot of product development, and then it goes into a contracted uh, extend, you know, three to four years, five years contracts. So yes, it is part of the earlier. Uh, but I would say that uh, as we look at India growing, uh, definitely three wheelers uh, transportation, last mile transportation is higher. So uh, as I told you. total oems for us is about 20% plus in some cases some segments even higher so we continue to be the leader in the franchisee workshop in the private sector so i would say that uh, you know we don't uh, the exact figures the, the growth that we have got with piaggio has again been positive i would say it's been positive the last many years covid of course we saw a bit of uh, you know a lull at that time so we continue to try to grow at least as i said 2 uh, to 3x the market growth rate which is currently 3 to 4% even for uh, our oems Got it. So let's talk about quarter three now, uh, because quarter two did see a lot of impact uh, of elections. We did see, uh, uh, you know, some uh, uh, some slowdown in terms of volume growth, which has been strong so far. Of course, what has the quarter three looked like so far? You saw double digit growth in PCO, DEO. There was good performance in B two B as well. Can you give us a sense of whether quarter three or the second half will be better than the first half? Usually the second half is better than the first half. You are right because uh, H two is uh, October, November, December, and then you have the closing in Jan, Feb, March where a lot of push happens. But if you take consumption point of view, the monsoons, which is July, August, September, is generally a low quarter. But this time with the elections, we saw that there were and the festivals coming together. We did see a slight uh, challenge in quarter two. I think now H two is certainly going to be better for the industry in terms of overall demand. For Gulf, uh, we are focused on our segments. So most of our segments we are clocking in a good, you know, high single digit, close to double digit as we mentioned. But obviously one segment which is factory fill, where we supply majorly to the commercial vehicles, that is about seven eight percent of our business, and that is down fifteen twenty percent. So that I hope it picks up in H two. So I think all the uh, feedback we are getting from the market is that yes, things will uh, look better in H two. and uh, definitely november december we hope that we'll see a, a sort of uh, uh, you know increase in terms of demand and uh, in our uh, strategy we want to uh, we have been growing well and i think uh, what we shared also on quarter 2 uh, a lot of our segments have done well except factory fill which i mentioned is uh, slightly down but even that is expected to pick up going forward uh tell us this is a fair assessment so some in the market believe that the company despite growing much faster 2x of the industry 2 to 3x your core volume growth will still be in high single digits say from fi24 to fi27 8 9% is that a fair assessment and you'd spoken about margins of 12 to 14% uh what about over the longer term say in the next 3 4 years is there scope for you to expand margins given the premiumization efforts dedicated marketing initiatives cost management can we push up margins over the longer medium term Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, you know margin is. We have said that this is the twelve to fourteen percent band, rightly by you, and we are focusing a lot on our premium products. So the focus internally is to try to double the growth rate for premium products, which we also mentioned in quarter two. So the focus is there. But you see the the segments that we are in today, we are growing uh, in all the segments we are. So obviously we will not say no to growth. the volume growth uh, definitely if you take our 15 years average is also about 9% where industry is gone and recently last two years the growth has been double digit in volume for lubricants so i think we would like to go uh, to definitely that 2 to 3x and many segments we have less than 5% market share passenger car motor oils industrials tractor scooter so uh, we see in the infrastructure segment so we see that we can in fact grow a bit faster so i endeavor is to do that but uh, definitely to give a commitment on margin and what is going to be there is competitive pricing there is uh, raw material inputs and uh, some of the things do have a lag time in, in terms of the b2b segments also so our endeavor and our objective has always been try to go to the next band and uh, i think with uh, if things work well across 
the input cost, the premiumization, and of course, competitive pricing, we should be able to see our uh, band uh, improve. Okay, all right. So you are adding a lot new products as well. The EV value chain is something that you're focusing on. We'd like to discuss more on that, but uh, today we are completely out of time, Mr. Chavala. So that discussion for some other time. So thank you so much for joining in today and giving us all those details. Okay, well, that's the word coming in from Gulf Oil Lubricants. With that, we'll slip into a short break. When we come back, we'll get you more on the markets on the other side. Stay tuned for that. Welcome back. So HUL held its Capital Markets Day and one of the key focus areas is going to be growth and category targets that they've set out. So Manglam is here to give us the highlights. Manglam. Well, HUL's Capital Markets Day is uh, very well sought after not only by HUL shareholders but all consumer sector analysts and enthusiasts largely because of the large macro trends that HUL usually speaks about. Remember the last three, four years hasn't been much in terms of revenue and profit growth. is just about 30%. Whereas uh, market share gain has been about 200 basis points as well. Uh, they have seen better performance in hair care and they've also seen the highest share that they've uh, had in hair care in the last 10 years. But the company has spoken about growth opportunities in premiumization, in beauty and wellness, as well as food and refreshments. Both those categories have been uh, disappointing when it comes to growth. There has been muted top line growth for Horlicks as well. So what's the strategy going forward? The underlying macro suggests the opportunity is near two to four times growth in the next decade itself, of which more than 80% coming in from internal core, uh, you know, and uh, core brands and market makers as well, for which they've identified 10 brands. They also see 100 basis points plus savings coming in through efficiencies. The six long-term market opportunities for them, premium face care, premium health care, uh, premium hair care, body wash, prestige, well-being, as well as condiments. Remember, they very recently launched the Hellman's Mayo in India itself. Uh, as far as digital is concerned, you know, they have 1.4 million retailers onboarded. More than 50% of their traditional trade revenue now comes in from their own proprietary Shikhar app. And more importantly, share of TV in advertising has come down from 60% all the way down to 39%, telling you more than 40% of their ad spends are going towards social media itself. The most important announcement so far, as per me, is them having spoken about winning in many Indias 2.0. Remember, the Vimy strategy, when it first came in 2014, actually uh, you know, classified India into 16 socio-economic clusters. And now we've been talking about the emergence of an affluent category in India as well, right? So Vimy 2.0 will further target sales to this affluent cluster. And as a result of which, they are looking at hyper-premiumization in the categories that I just spoke about. The premiumization, which was earlier taken away in terms of market share from a lot of these D2C brands. So the strategy is laid out. Um, it is all about the execution, whether they can do it or not. It is all about the execution and the fact that TV spends are going down. It's all about social media as well. So watching out for that. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Manglam, for bringing out all those trends for us. That's the outlook on HUL. But we'll slip into another break. When we come back, we'll discuss market fundamentals with Jyoti Vardhan Jaipuria from Valentis Advisors. Welcome back. You're still tuned into trading. Ah, the markets continue their up move. It's a 200 point uptick on the Nifty. The mid caps are lagging a bit, but this week has been a good week for the mid caps as well. But we have to discuss market fundamentals. Jyoti Vardhan Jaipuria, founder and managing director of Valentis Advisors, uh, is joining us now. Uh, Jyoti Vardhan, good morning. Thank you for joining in. Well, um, how are you looking at the markets currently? There's been a lot of volatility, two days of FI buying, then there's a big sell number. Uh, what's the mood now? 
Yes, so, you know, the good thing is that we've had a correction. So, at least valuations have become a little better than what they were earlier. From here, I think, you know, we still will have some sort of more time correction than a price correction. We're entering December, of course, which is a seasonally strong month. So, I think over the next few months, we'll probably be range-bound in this range. And given that earnings are growing, we'll probably see, you know, valuations becoming cheaper three months, six months down the road. And that will set the stage for the next run in the market. Uh, Jyoti, hi. Uh, morning. What about the global setup? Lots of moving parts here. What is your base case? Uh, so, you know, Riva, I think the good thing is Trump will finally come in January. He's made a lot of announcements before, but with politicians, what they say before the elections may not turn out to be true after the elections. So, in the worst case, I guess, you know, there are two things we are looking at. One is that he's going to put tariffs all across the board. And there'll be tariffs on China, there'll be tariffs on, like he's announced, Mexico and Canada also, which in some sense is good for India indirectly because, you know, it makes Indian goods cheaper relative to Chinese goods. But I think, you know, there are two things you have to watch out there. Once he puts tariffs, then, you know, there may be a lot of other countries starting to put tariffs. The second is my guess is if he does this tariffs, China will go and devalue their currency to, you know, offset the impact of the tariff. If that happens, then, you know, every country in the emerging market space will probably have to devalue their currency, which is not great. You don't want a competitive devaluation across the board. The third is what this does for U.S. is this whole inflation coming under control narrative may go away because the moment he puts tariffs, then, you know, goods become more expensive and inflation will start going up again. So to that extent, you know, the view that next year we'll have Fed cutting rates and, you know, rates are headed much lower may not work out to be true, which may, you know, spook the market for some time. But my guess is we should wait till he comes because very often he saves all this as a bargaining position. In the end, he may not do most of what he's talking about also. But, you know, Jyoti, and if we do get those uh, tariffs on China, one uh, impact, as you said, would be perhaps uh, the yuan depreciates. Also, the risk is that what if China starts dumping all their excess uh, capacity into India and that will hurt the domestic growth if we do have that scenario also play out, that there's dumping from China because the U.S. as a market is not viable. And uh, the dumping on China, we've seen what has happened Happen in the, the chemicals, chemicals industry. Uh, they have been lagging because of that. So there are a lot of moving paths that we've been talking about as well. Uh, so, you know, you are saying there is some correction in valuations that has happened because uh, the market's corrected from the top. But the fear that everyone has, uh, has is, is there more to go? Uh, what has the conversation been like with companies for quarter three? Because first half did see some impact on demand. Do you think now we'll see recovery, maybe some improvement in earnings? Yeah, so, so well, you know, my views, we had two bad quarters. You know, probably the market ignored the June bad quarter because the markets were good at that time. It was ignoring all the bad news. And it hit us a lot in the September quarter because the market was going down also. Uh, so I think, you know, somewhere we are close to a bottom of the earnings. Earnings will start to improve. There are two reasons I think earnings will improve. One is if you see the government capex and the government spending. In the first half, it's been very low, partly because of the model code of conduct and the elections which are being. I think second half, the spending will be much more. I think, for example, on capex, they'll do an average one lakh crores every month relative to, you know, so which will be like up 50% relative to what they did in the first half. So that will help growth improve. The second is rural income will pick up because we had a good monsoon, good crops. The farmers will start getting this money by, you know, the next month. And so that will start kicking into rural demand. So I think, you know, maybe that impact will be felt more in the March quarter than in the December quarter. December quarter may be slightly better than what we saw in the uh, September quarter. But I think the March quarter will be much better than what we've seen in the December quarter. I think we go back to a, you know, close to 10% sort of earnings growth. And which I think FY26 again should be 10 to 11% sort of earnings growth. So I think from the low we've seen, we're probably going to see an improvement in earnings coming through. Mm. Uh, financials, you know, has been attractive for a long, long time, but it's not given the returns. Um, tell us why one should still continue to keep the faith on financials. Uh, so, you know, it's valuation, Dima. So, for us, it is... What but it's is... been cheap for a while, right? And the whole market yeah. went up and it still didn't perform. Yeah, so, you know, there are problems there just now. There are two problems with the financials currently. One is the NIMS are under pressure, right? Because, you know, you've seen basically a repricing of the deposits going up. Uh, the second problem which you have is basically, you know, everybody's worried that, okay, the NPLs are more or less bottomed out and from here things can only get worse. 
we've seen some of that stress come in the MFI book, in the unsecured loan book. So going forward, two things will change. So one is, you know, the names will start to improve because already you started seeing deposit growth pick up. And, you know, one key reason why deposit growth was under pressure was that the government was not spending. So, you know, the reserve money growth in India has been very low. So as the government spends, you'll have, you know, more reserve money, you'll have more liquidity in the system, and that will help to improve the deposit scenario. And so slowly, you know, you'll start to see names stabilizing and starting to move up. Credit demand, just remember, is still decent. So it's not been like lagging. The other is the valuation. So, you know, we have this classic three use which we always look at when we buy stocks or sectors. And so just now it's undervalued. Uh, so banks are the only space where, you know, on a 10-year basis, if you look at the valuation and look at them currently, current valuations are at a discount to a 10-year. So banks is, you know, one of the only probably large sectors where this is happening. Second is it's under owned and third is it's underperformed quite a bit. So, you know, it may take time because if the rate cuts happen, then probably NIMS come under pressure very short term. So, but you know, over the next 12, 18 months, this is one space where you'll make a lot of money and your risk on the downside is quite limited in the banks. Okay, all right, we take that point. So keep an eye out on financials, the credit growth update going forward. That'll be very important to track. Uh, the sector hasn't done so well versus the other sectors that we have seen. But Jodhi Vardhan, thank you so much for joining in as always with your views on the markets and sector specific uh, queries as well. Well, that's all about markets, but it's time for another break. Tanvi Gupta Jain, the economist at UBS, will join in on the other side to discuss their India outlook, Trump 2.0 impact on India and a lot more. Welcome back. The second quarter GDP number is due today uh, at 4 p.m. Lata is here with the expectations. Lata. Big number we await today at 4 p.m. is the second quarter GDP number. Our CNBC TV 18 poll sees Q2 GDP at 6.5% and that's the lowest in six quarters. This 6.5% compares with 6.7% in just the previous Q1 and 8.1% year ago in Q2. The Reserve Bank itself has forecast 6.8% uh, growth for uh, Q2, the quarter that ended on September 30th, uh, but that is down from its earlier forecast of 7%. Now, our poll also sees the GVA gross value added at 6.5%, same as GDP, versus 6.8% Q1 and 7.7% year ago. The GVA actually is a better measure of the economy. GVA, uh, you just have to add taxes, subtract subsidies to get uh, to the GDP. Now, as per our poll, GDP is dragged down partly by poor showing of manufacturing and electricity. However, services are expected to have done well at 8.2%. Let's see. Uh, looking at GDP from the expenditure side, the fear is that government capex uh, or gross fixed capital formation, as it's called, it, which was doing well till uh, a year till about a quarter ago may have slumped in q2 our poll also shows that some economists including the reserve bank see a very smart rebound in the second half uh, that's uh, the cnbc tv in poll expecting 6.8 to 7% growth in the second half q3 and q4 uh, the reserve bank itself expecting 7.4 but uh, not all uh, people in the poll are agreeable to even 6.8 to 7 percent. So that 7 percent plus growth which the Reserve Bank is forecasting doesn't have too many supporters now. So have we given up the 7 percent growth pace altogether which we had over the last three years? That we will know only in May of 2025 next May.
Okay, all right. Thank you, Lada, for joining in with what to expect from the GDP data. In fact, let's also invite in Tanvi Gupta Jain, the economist at UBS, to understand what are their projections. Remember, UBS has lowered India's FY26 growth forecast by 50 basis points to 6.3%. They believe softer domestic growth and a Trump tariff on China will impact India. Uh, Tanvi, good morning. Thank you so much for joining in. Well, I just wanted you to elaborate on the rationale that you have for uh, lowering the GDP forecast. Because some believe that maybe if there are tariffs in China, that would be positive for India. What's your take and why are you factoring in lower growth? Sure. Thank you for having me on the show. Uh, so, yes, you are right. We are expecting uh, a lower GDP growth for India in FI26. In fact, we have actually lowered our forecast by 50 basis point to 6.3% right now. And this is largely taking account two factors. One is uh, Trump 2 and what it means for India. And the second is the softening in growth momentum, which we are already seeing on the ground. While we expect a cyclical recovery in second half of FI25, we think that there are more concerns on the growth softening, partly because of the global uncertainties which are increasing. So let me elaborate a bit uh, why we are downgrading India's growth forecast. So we think that Trump too can impact India through three channels. One is what happens to the global growth because of a slower US and the China's growth. So our UBS economics team has lowered global GDP growth forecast by 30 basis point for both 2025 and 2026. Uh, we think India is a low beta economy uh, because uh, unlike the Asians, more open economies, but I think India is not immune. So there is going to be an impact on India's growth as well because of a slowing global growth. Uh, second is where I think where I'm more worried about is a further delay in India's private corporate capex recovery due to risk of China's offloading excess capacity in the manufacturing sector. And we have seen so far that bulk of the heavy lifting on the India's investment cycle was either done by the government or the residential property market doing very well. The corporate sector yet, or at least from the data of 4,500 companies that we track, has shown a recovery, but it is concentrated in a very narrow part of corporate India. And in case we do end up seeing Trump to a uh, related tariff hike on US and uh, US imposing on China, I think that excess capacity will further delay the corporate capex recovery in India. And third, which is very interesting, and I think it should matter more from an FX policy point of view, is that uh, any risk of a greater depreciation pressure on China's RMB could have implications on India's net good trade balance. And we saw it what happened in 2018-19, China's RMB depreciated by almost 13%. Uh, this time, my China economist is talking about a 5% weakness in RMB. We are expecting a two and a half, three percent weakness in INR next year. So INR actually appreciates against RMB, which again makes it easier uh, for the corporate to import uh, from China rather than expanding domestic investment capacity. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I would say largely uh, the growth slowdown risk is more because of US. China trade war and plus the softening we are already seeing. But as you rightly pointed out, I think India will see a strengthening of China plus one supply chain shifts. Uh, and we are already seeing a lot of supportive policy measures to boost manufacturing. Uh, so if I look at a year beyond 2025, we are actually saying India's GDP growth could actually recover to 6.6% in FI27 uh, because of India gaining uh, from in the medium term. Uh, perspective. So Tanvi, your base case assumes that uh, Trump imposes a 60% tariff on China. That's the base case. And what about the other wheeled thread about a 10% import tariff on the rest of the world? Is that baked in? And if it does come through, what will be the impact on India? Sure. So the base case right now is that Trump imposed 60% tariff on 75% of China's goods starting from the September quarter of next year. And we are expecting that increase happens in tranches, lower the larger. Uh, so basically, initial tranches will be lesser taxes. And as you move up in the fourth tranche, tax impact will be much higher. For most of our Asian economies, we're expecting a much sharper impact on the global, on their GDP forecast for 2026 versus 2025. Because India follows financial year, obviously, uh, since we are expecting uh, impact to start feeling into the numbers from the September quarter, India could see bulk of the impact in FI26 onwards. Uh, so we are not yet expecting tariff hike 
beyond that 60 person or on other other countries but in case you end up seeing because right now all the media reports are talking about what if trump is imposing extra tariffs on you know countries beyond china and in case there's a 10 percent tariff hike on rest of the world I would see there is a downside of 30 basis point to my 2026 or FI27 GDP growth forecast, which I'm currently at 6.6. Okay. All right, then we uh, we get that point. Uh, I would have liked to chat a little bit more, but completely out of time. But thank you so much for joining in and telling us what's your rationale for downgrading those GDP growth forecasts for the next fiscal. Uh, time for a short break now. We'll get you more on the markets on the other side. Welcome back. Well, there's a sharp fall from the highs. The mid-cap index is in the red as we speak. The bank nifty too is in the red. And that is leading to the fall in the nifty also from the highs of the day. We were up around 220 points when we started the show. Now we are up just 165. And there you go. Nifty bank and mid-cap index. Both of them are at the day's low. We'll keep tracking that for you, but we did have a listing, a new kid on the block. Enviro Infra Engineers had a bumper listing on the bosses at a near 50% premium of 220 versus an issue price of 148 rupees a share. The management of Enviro Infra spoke to CNBC TV18 uh, post listing. Let's listen to that conversation. The top line of the company, if you see in the last three years, it was around 30%, uh, 80% on CAGR basis. Uh, going forward, uh, we expect uh, a decent figure of around 30 to 35 percent on the top line we will maintain. And in terms of uh, margins, EBITDA margins, uh, it will be in the range of 24 to 25 percent. The order book is 1906 uh, on 30th June. Uh, in July, uh, we got one more project uh, from NMCG. It is 267 crore project. So total order books uh, gives us the visibility of around uh, for the next two years and further uh, this uh, year, uh, current year, it was being the election year and uh, uh, very less projects were uh, floated by the government departments. Uh, going forward in the uh, third quarter and fourth quarter, we are expecting a lot of schemes uh, which the government has initiated. Uh, number of uh, projects will come up and uh, we are uh, quite confident uh, based on our success ratio which we have achieved in the last three years, uh, we will beg good orders. By the way, the markets are falling now. The mid-cap index, which was up in the green marginally, is now down about a quarter of a percent. And there's a fall in the last 10, 15 minutes. Uh, the Nifty was at levels of 24,120, thereabout. So from that level, we've fallen close to about 40, 50 points. And in the frontline pack, it's the Adani Group names, which have come in for profit booking. So Adani Enterprises, Adani Ports. Enterprises is down 1%. Adani Ports has flattened out. So things are getting a bit weak. The banks too, the Nifty Banking Index, which was up it's just 70, 80 points 15 minutes back, is now down 100 points. That's the Nifty Bank for you. We're going to wrap up on trading hour from the entire team. Thank you for watching.